a legitimate ML model should be able to capture the underlying structure of the input data. However, oftentimes we may find our model memorizing the training data or failing to generalize to the test dataset. Or sometimes we may find the model is too naive to predict a valid output. We call these cases underfitting or overfitting in machine learning. Let's take a look at them one by one. So let's start with the underfitting. When we monitor the model loss and the model performance, we may find out that the model performance poorly on both training and test dataset. So why it happens? The fundamental reason is that the model is too simple to capture the underlying structure of the training data. Maybe you should think of adding more features or improve the complexity of your models. For example, for neural networks, probably you can add more layers or more units in a layers. We also call the underfitting model as a high bias model. From a statistic point of view, its results show systematic lack of fit in certain region. Well, on the other hand, the model may end up in another extreme scenario, which is the overfitting. In this case, even though the model performs well on training data, it doesn't generalize well on new unseen data, which is the test data set. This case often happens because the model is too complex, like the plot showing on our left hand side. This means the model might memorize all the noise of the training set rather than capturing the underlying relationship between the features. In this case, the model may have relative large feature size compared with the training data set. So you can either add more data or to the training data set or downgrade the model complexity. We often call this model high variance model in the statistic context, which means small changes in input data will lead to large changes in output results. So the optimal model should neither underfitted nor overfitted. In this case, the model is neither too simple nor too complex, and it performs well on both training and test dataset, which means it's capable to capture the underlying structure of the input features. And the optimal model is of low bias and low variance. To sum up, let's draw three scenarios over the plot here, where the x-axis explains the model complexity and the y-axis explains the model loss. So we can draw the training loss and the generalization loss in this plot. As we are increasing the model complexity, the training loss always decreases. However, the generalization loss may decrease at first and then bumps back if the model is too complicated. Well, the optimal model should be in between of overfitting and underfitting model, where both training and generalization loss are relatively low. That's why we care about the bias and the variance of the model. We also call it the bias variance trade off, which is based on a famous statistic rule the total model error or the model loss. It roughly equals its bias plus its variance. Hence, 
To find the optimal model, we need to find the balance between underfitted model, which is of high bias, low variance, and overfitted model, which is of high variance and low biases. Well, one more crucial step when we start to tackle the machine learning model is to define the model evaluation matrix. This matrix should be highly tied to the business problem that we want to solve. And in this lecture, we will focus on evaluation matrix for regression and classification models. So here is a full table of evaluation matrix that I'm going to introduce in this particular class. And there are definitely much more evaluation matrix out there being used for different applications. But here are the common used ones. Let's take a look of each of them one by one. So the first one is a main square arrow or MSE also being referred as the L2 loss. It is one of the most preferred matrices for regression tasks. It is simply the average of the square difference between the target value and the value predicted by the regression models. Well, as MSE squares the difference, it penalized even a small arrow which leads to overestimated of how bad the model it is. It is preferred more than other matrix because it is differentiable and hence it can be optimized better. And the second one is the root mean square arrow or RMSE is the most widely used matrix for regression task, and it is a square root of the average squared difference between the target value and the value predicted by the model. It's performed more in some cases because the arrows are first squared before averaging, which pose a high penalty on large arrows. This implies that the RMSE is useful when large arrow are undesired. Well, next is the main absolute arrow, or MAE, or we often call it the L1 loss. So MAE is absolute difference between the target value and the value predicted by the model. And the MAE is more robust to the outliers and does not penalize the arrow as extremely as the MSE. So MAE is a linear score, which means all the individual differences are weighted equally. However, it is not suitable for applications where you want to pay more attention to the outliers. And last but not the least is the R square, also called coefficient of determination is another matrix for evaluating the performance of a regression model. And the matrix help us to compare our current model with the constant baseline and tell us how much our model is better. And the constant baseline, which is the denominator of the equation, is the variance of the given data set. So R square is always less than or equal to one. So after the regression matrix, let's take a look of the classification matrices. So first is the confusion matrix. It is a performance measurement for either binary or multi-class classification problem. In a binary scenario, it is a table with four different combinations of predictive and actual values. So the true positive, or TP, means the model predict positive when the actual truth is positive. The false positive, FP, means the model predicted positive when the actual is negative. Well, the 
false negative or Fn, predicted negative when the actual is positive. And last but not least, the true negative predicted negative when the actual truth is negative. Let's take a look of a two example here, where we have two classes, the positive class in blue and the negative class in orange. And now we use this ellipse as a model where data points inside the ellipse are being classified as positive, outside as negative. And we can now count the points and write down the counts into our confusion matrix for TP, FP, F1, and TN. For example, there are two blue dots outside the blue ellipse, so the F1 is 3. Similarly, there is only one orange dot inside the blue ellipse, so the FP is 1. Well, with confusion matrix, we can start evaluating the classification problem with the following matrix. And the first matrix is the accuracy. It means how much percentage of the predictions are correct. Well, the math formula of accuracy can be explained by the sum of true positive and true negative divided by the total sampled number. So in our examples, the accuracy can be calculated by 19 plus 3 and then divided by the total sample number, which is 88% of accuracy. So accuracy is between 0 and 1. Ideally, we wish the model has an accuracy as high as possible. However, only a high accuracy output may be a bit biased in this example, the model has a 90% of accuracy. However, if we look into the detail of the table, we may find that the model highly prefer to predict negative results and seldom predict the positive outputs. If we count how many positive cases does it output, it just 2 plus 2 equals to 4 cases. And within these four cases, half of them are predicted wrong. Hence, the accuracy matrix itself won't be enough. And that's why we need another matrix called precision, which is the accuracy of all the positive predictions. That is TP divided by sum of TP plus FP. In our example, the precision is 50%, which is a bit low. Like the accuracy matrix, precision is percentage numbers between 0 and 1, and the higher, the better. Well, besides precision, we have another matrix, which focuses on only the positive cases and the ground truth. That is the recall matrix, which measures the model ability to predict a positive outcome. So it equals the TP or true positive divided by the total number of the positive ground truth. And in our example, the recall is 20%, which is tremendous low. And this matrix is extremely useful when we are dealing with the imbalanced data scenario, such as the real disease diagnosis, where we want to focus the model's abilities to capture the positive cases as much as possible. And again, the higher the recall, the better the model might be. The precision and recall matrix always work together as evaluation matrix. However, two matrix might be a little bit difficult for us to compare between different model performance. And that is why we need the F1 score, which is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. 
So similarly, f1 is a number between 0 and 1. If we draw it to a 2D plot which with precision versus recall, and the blue region plot here means one of the precision or recall, or both of them are low, which is not an ideal model. However, if the F1 score is closer to 1, which means both precision and recall are close to 1, this will be the ideal model performance. And that's all of the common used evaluation matrix you will need for this class. As I previously mentioned, there are definitely much more evaluation matrices out there being used for different applications. And we need to be careful to pick one or many of them to evaluate our models based on our business problem requirements.